Hi, so this session, in keeping with our conference theme, brings together uh, folks from the public perspective. And they're going to talk about what they would like industry and regulators to be more aware of from their perspective, as well as the types of things they'd like to hear about when industry and regulators are talking with the public about pipeline safety and pipeline issues. So I'm going to introduce each of you individually right before you come up. And we're going to start with John Tynan, who's from Central Arkansas Water. Um, Central Arkansas Water serves about over 400,000 people in the greater Little Rock area. And uh, their primary source of drinking water is Lake Maumel, through wh whose watershed runs about 13 miles of a crude oil pipeline. And they got a wake-up call about a year and a half ago when that same pipeline ruptured just immediately outside their service area. Um, and five to 7,000 barrels of crude oil were spilled um, near Lake Conway. So John's going to talk about, from a public drinking water perspective, what they would like to know and um, hear about from pipeline operators when it comes to, to safety. Thanks, John. Thanks again, and uh, good morning. And uh, I think we're the last panel standing between us and lunch. So uh, I think we'll only take a couple of hours to get there. Uh, I want to thank the trust, one, for having me, uh, and two, also, uh, as we've been dealing with uh, the, the issues that I'm going to go through in a minute, serving as a great source of uh, information and resources for us. Um, I'm a water and water utility guy. I never thought I'd be working on uh, crude oil pipelines, but I've had the great fortune to add probably about another three dozen acronyms to my, um, to my belt in going through all this stuff, and, and it's been quite interesting. Uh, just a bit of background about what Central Arkansas Water has uh, been, been working on as a result of the ExxonMobil Pegasus pipeline rupture. Um, given a quick overview right here, the line runs from Illinois all the way down to Texas. Uh, it was constructed in 1948, so we're dealing with uh, pre-1950s vintage pipe. Uh, it's 850 miles long. The, it originally, the flow originally went from Texas up to Illinois uh, and carried uh, lighter, uh, lighter materials, uh, but then it was reversed in 2006. Uh, it carries Wabasca Heavy Crude, um, also called Dilbit, uh, and then, again, it ruptured in Mayflower uh, on Good Friday in March of 2013, uh, estimated at 210,000 gallons of, of product spilled. Uh, now, why does that matter to Central Arkansas Water? Well, you can see this uh, on the map. There's that green star. That's where the Mayflower rupture occurred. Uh, and Central Arkansas Water, our primary water source to 400,000 people, is Lake Maumel, which is there in blue. Um, bit of Watershed 101, if anything spills in, or hits the ground in that light blue area, it's ending up in our lake at some point. Uh, so that's only eight and a half pipeline miles away. Thankfully, it was in a different drainage area, but had that 210,000 gallons of product spilled eight pipeline miles away, we would be in a very different situation today than we are now. Uh, again, we supply drinking water for over 400,000 people. Uh, that, air, that red line running through our watershed is about 13 and a half miles of the Pegasus Pipeline. Uh, it's fairly rugged and inaccessible terrain, so whereas the Mayflower clean, cleanup benefited from interstate highways and asphalt roads, we're looking at um, very rugged, inaccessible, no roads uh, almost in that 13 and a half miles of pi pipeline that goes through our drainage. So everything we did before the Mayflower rupture was based on what we thought we knew to be the case. Uh, and this is really where we get into the, well, what we know, what we need to know, and we, what, what we want the public and industry to know. Um, we didn't wake up after the Mayflower rupture and say, oh my goodness, we need to start doing stuff. We had been doing emergency response uh, preparation. We had been acquiring emergency response materials, and we had been doing regular inspections of the pipeline through the watershed. Um, we created our own emergency response plan, and we had been doing a number of drills with that. Um, we had actually worked with ExxonMobil to create a tactical response plan. 
Um, just as a side note, even though this was created, it's still never been field tested. We've never done any dry runs with it. Uh, and we actually never even had a copy of this until after the Mayflower spill uh, occurred, which was about two to three years after this document was, was released. So access to information like that um, for both us and emergency responders is one of the key things that, that came out of our experience. Again, we'd been collecting emergency response materials. We mirrored an emergency response trailer after one of Exxon Mobil's. Um, we have uh, done pipeline inspections, identifying areas where there's significant erosion, where there's ex significant exposures, where there's not supposed to be. Uh, this is a low flow area, but this is a very flashy stream at times with a lot of logging activities up, upstream of it. So you can have whole trees and boulders being moved down this, um, down this stream channel um, when you have this 60 to 70 foot section of pipe being exposed. So then we had the Mayflower rupture. Uh, and what that led to for us was a lot of um, questions, a lot of information requests, um, actions that we've requested from Exxon and from federal regulators. And then also we've had to pursue both legal as well as administrative actions on our own so that we could do everything we can to try and protect our watershed from issues in the future. Uh, information requests, we had asked for um, things like, you know, just basic elevation profiles. We created this one on our own after a significant delay in being able to get some. Um, overall, we asked for information about what led to the Mayflower rupture and also assurances that that same situation couldn't happen eight miles away in our drinking water area. Um, we asked about integrity management practices, results, protocols, uh, and we asked for information about the product. Previously, we had been told that this was just a standard run-of-the-mill product, that it floats when it hits water, and then after the Mayflower rupture, we've gotten three different MSDS sheets, each with a different specific gravity, so we have no idea whether this product floats, sinks, does a mixture of both, or how it reacts in the environment. Uh, we've had some success getting access to that information, um, but had to do that through a confidentiality agreement because of proprietary and competitive concerns. Um, so that's why we only have one brief slide. We also asked for some risk reduction activities. Uh, we asked for an update of emergency response plans. We asked for additional valving in the watershed. We asked for additional training, both for us and emergency responders, uh, and uh, improved access to the pipeline itself. Uh, and then finally, or also related to risk reduction, we are, at the same time, we're pursuing not only risk reduction, but also risk elimination. So we have asked for and want to start a dialogue on the process for relocating this section of the pipeline outside of our drinking water area. And then finally, we did pursue some legal and administrative actions. We updated our own vulnerability assessment uh, and looked not just at this pipeline, but in all things that might affect our utility. Uh, we increased our analytic capabilities. Uh, we, and then finally, we submitted a notice of intent to sue PHMSA and Exxon under the Pipeline Safety Act because of numerous issues and concerns we had about prior integrity management activities. Uh, following that, there actually was a notice of probable violation that PHMSA issued related to the Mayflower rupture and prior integrity management and, and a proposed compliance order as well that had $2.6 million in fines uh, associated with it. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So. Again, after the Mayflower rupture, that was kind of a changing moment of we didn't know quite as much as we thought we did um, before the rupture. Um, and what it has identified for us is things that we feel we should, need, should know and what we need to know in order to adequately protect our drinking water supply. Um, so first is just basic operational information. Um, where the valving is, how the valving's operated, what are the procedures that uh, the, the uh, pipeline operator uses to safeguard areas like our drinking water supply? Um, what pressure does it operate under uh, typically? You know, how close is that to the maximum operating pressure? What's their response time? What capabilities and materials are nearby? 
Uh, information about the product, does it float, does it sink, and how does that inform our response capabilities? What's the effect on the envi our environment? What's the treatability of that product? All these are questions that we as a public drinking water supplier need to know in order to provide a, a safe source of water with as low risk as we can for our customers. Uh, at, a majority of our concern and questions at this point really focus on integrity management. Uh, so more information and more engagement from Central Arkansas Water or any public entity, uh, local government, drinking water supplier, where you have a situation like this, um, and access to what is the integrity management plan. How can we uh, get information about what results are found, what actions are being taken to safeguard, because in the end, you know, knowledge for us helps us take that information and convey it to our customers and our stakeholders that are coming to us as a source of information, coming to us uh, with questions about how safe is my drinking water. And we need to be able to provide to them um, clear and decisive answers, not more questions or not we're working on it. Um, related to integrity management, uh, regular response exercises uh, should be something that we get in place more often. Uh, and then engagement opportunities in jurisdiction. Uh, that's one of the, the areas where I, I feel there's been a lot of questions for us, and, I, and I'm glad to see the trust coming out with the local government guidebook, and, and we have relied on that as well as their expertise. Uh, but the main thing for us is, is a lot of those opportunities out there focus on new pipelines um, and new pipeline siting issues. Um, we're dealing with a 1940s pipeline that has been in the ground for quite some time. And so what are our opportunities to get involved and engage on uh, those decisions related to the safety and management of that pipeline? So how can we review, comment, and be in the know about the integrity management plan? Um, how can we review, comment, and get engaged in the remedial work plan submission that's associated with this pipeline uh, under the compliance order related to the Mayflower rupture? Uh, and I mentioned that there was a, a appeal here, or I, I mentioned there was a fine and notice of probable violation. Um, we actually had asked to attend the appeal hearing so that we could hear the discussions that were going on about um, whether the integrity management plan was sufficient prior to this rupture. We were told we couldn't go, um, that that was a closed meeting. So you know, all again, all these things, knowledge, is in, knowledge and information that we can gain, that we can share with our customers is critical for us to move things forward. And uh, related to jurisdiction, uh, again, We've talked a lot about jurisdiction related to um, new pipelines, um, and that's clearly, clearly out there as well. But one of the things that we found is that in a, once at every turn, uh, we were essentially told, well, local governments can't do anything related to pipelines. That's, you're preempted by federal regulations. Well, the more and more you deal into this, that may be true related to safety regulations, but there's a whole host of other jurisdictional opportunities that local governments have. So whether it's through the trust, whether it's through FEMSA, whether it's through the industry, we need to stop perpetuating this myth that local governments can't take any action whatsoever. Uh, there, that may be true in some small areas, but when you look at the whole uh, of pipeline related issues, there are actions that local governments can take and we need to empower them and inform them and let them take those actions. Thank you.